Hello everyone and welcome to the Dyslexia Life Hacks show. I'm your host, Matthew Head. And in this episode, I'm talking to Matt Bird. He's the founder and CEO of Publish You, a company that coaches over 100 people per year to write and publish their own books. He's also the author of over 20 books and has previously won the book of the year. He's a writer for newspaper columns, which have been featured in papers such as The Times. And somehow he manages to find extra time around this to run numerous other projects. As always, I'll put links to Matt's companies as well as other things we talk about in the show notes, which will be available at dyslexialifehacks.com for such podcasts. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hey, great to be with you, Matthew. And may I first uh, compliment you on the name? <laughs> yes, yes. This is, um, when we were sorting this out, there ended up being three Matts on an email chain, and that just got confusing after a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. I get called, yeah, I get called Matt nowadays. My mum still calls me Matthew and I'm naughty, but... Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My, my mum calls me Math and then Matthew if I've done something really, really wrong. But I don't hear that much anymore. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've grown out of that one. <laughs> but where I wanted to start our conversation off today is that you spend time between London and Italy. And I wonder how you found not only sort of the language change, but sort of dyslexia opinion between the two countries. Yeah, well, I haven't learned to say dyslexia yet in Italian, so I'm not sure. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I love the I love the sunshine, and okay, yeah. wouldn't wouldn't it be lovely to have a little place in uh, you know somewhere sunnier than London, which isn't that difficult most of the year. <laughs> so yeah, so I headed south all the way down to a city called Noto uh, mm. on, the, on the Italian island of Sicily, and it's a beautiful place to be um, because I'm really committed to the community. And the people I'm trying to learn Italian, yeah. Uh, but as a dyslexic, I do not find that easy. No, no, no. It's um, language learning can be tricky with with dyslexia. Are you employing any sort of novel strategies to try and get language learning down? No, I was rather hoping if I mentioned it on here, somebody might message us <laughs> and, and tell us what the tricks are because, uh, <laughs> you know, I've had a tutor. I try and talk Italian to locals, although they prefer to speak English. I don't speak my Italian. Um, I, use, <laughs> I use the Duolingo app, which is good, but sometimes I think it goes in one ear and out the other. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, I've tried, I'm trying to listen to the radio when I'm in Italy just to get the language. I don't I, most of it I have no idea what they're saying but I just want to hear the language and uh, and people have recommended watching films with subtitles but I really don't even though I've been learning for a year and a half I don't think I'm at that that, that level yet but uh, if anybody's got any tricks for learning a language as a dyslexic I would love to hear them <laughs> yes yeah Do, drop a message on the website or on post it a comment on social media and hopefully you get it back through because I've heard some various tricks, like reading comic books and stuff like that to try and learn language, but nothing hugely specific for dyslexic thinking. Um, because, you know, we had a bad enough time learning the English language at points, let alone... <laughs> oh, my goodness. I remember at school trying to learn French and they oh, used yeah. to kind of verb uh, was verb forms or whatever. And uh, I didn't know what they were in English, let alone French. I mean, goodness me. Yeah, yeah. I had the same problem with French and modern languages at school, that they were referring back to the English, you know, the, the very much the English literature, how it's all built and, you know, your pronouns and your your, your verbs and your whatever, prepositions and stuff. But I hadn't got that down. So I don't know how that was going to help me learn the other language. <laughs> like, I don't know oh. these words in English. So come on, can we do it another way, please? Yeah, totally, totally. So that brings me to your school days. Did you know that you were dyslexic as a kid? No, I didn't. I I I, I struggled at school. Uh, they put me in remedial English classes, remedial maths classes. Told me I couldn't do computer studies because my grasp of the English language wasn't good enough. Uh, left school believing I was stupid because that's mm -hmm. what most most of my teachers. Well, there was one that didn't, but most of my teachers told me. So, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the best you know start you know my education it wasn't my best uh, platform for launching into life. But uh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. So, how did you find out? What what actually triggered you to be like? Hang on, I'm not just whatever story you've been telling yourself at that point in time. Yeah, it was my my early twenties. I think it was my mum said to me, I, "You know, I think you're dyslexic." And my immediate uh, question was, "What's dyslexia?" <laughs> yeah. I, I had no idea what it what it was. So, yeah, that's when I first heard it, and um, yeah, I didn't know. Didn't know really what it was all about, and and when she explained it, I thought, 
you know, maybe I am. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so that was that was when it started. And uh, you know, like many people with dyslexia, you know, I really struggled with self worth, self esteem, self belief. I'd always felt a little bit like on the fringe and you know, uh, not in the in crowd. And uh, yeah, so it, it helped me understand one of the reasons why I might have struggled at school. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons. <laughs> okay. You <were> more to it <laughs> than that was there. <laughs> yeah, quite likely. Just 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 attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The problem is that sometimes you don't you don't know the causality, do you? You don't know if the attitude's no. fed by the fact you're struggling or the attitude comes from somewhere else. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally, totally. So but yeah, I moved I moved beyond that, thankfully, you know, and uh I think uh yeah, I think Holding my head high, looking people in the eye, you know, being self, growing in self confidence over the years, you know, as you know, that was that was a really significant milestone, but it didn't happen quickly. <laughs> no, I can imagine not. So you obviously in your twenties found that you're dyslexic. Did you you go for formal diagnosis? So what did you put in place after that? Was what was the sort? Of, Aha! I need to start doing this kind of thing. Well, there was no aha. It was just, oh. okay, I'm dyslexic. And uh, at the time, I thought, oh, well, that's a, that's a bit disadvantageous, isn't it? And that, that helps explain why school was difficult, uh, why I struggled to write, read, spell, concentrate. Yeah, I hated this. My, the, the lesson I hated most, more than French, actually, uh, <laughs> was dictation exercises. I got lost after the first sentence. I just I just felt oh. it was torturous. Do you remember those? Yes, where the teacher would read the book out loud and you had to write it down. Is that what you're on about? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. I had to copy my friends off the page next to me because I was n- lagging well behind by that point. Yeah. And yeah, couldn't read what I'd written down either. Yeah. So I think, yeah. So I think, you know, I think for me, getting over the belief that I was stupid was significant. Mm. Um, because whenever when something went, and I'd say I'm stupid, and people would tell me off and say, "No, you're not." But in the back of my mind, I still, when something went wrong or I failed at something or something didn't work out as I wanted, I just say in my mind, "Oh, it's because you're stupid." And it took mm. me years and years and years to stop saying that about myself. Um, yeah. And then the kind of self acceptance, self belief, self esteem, self worth that was significant. But I think it's taken me even longer. Really, it wasn't until my forties that I began to realise that that my dyslexia was actually my advantage, not my disadvantage. Yes. Yeah. And did you do any sort of thing to help you get past your sort of belief thing? Or was it just a bit of a kind of like, stop it, stop talking to yourself in this way, stop it? <laughs> it was. It was just a little bit of, yeah, just, yeah, stop it. No, don't, no, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, being loved and being liked, you know, mm. transformed. You know how I felt about myself. Yeah, uh, you know, and that for me, that was partly it was my my belief system. You know, I had a I started believing in God and knowing that He loved me and liked me. Right, and it was like lifted my lifted my self worth and my self esteem. So you know, but it's it's no good just hearing those words. They have to become real inside you, don't they? They do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So. You know, no matter how so- how often somebody told me I wasn't stupid, that didn't change anything. It just it was just a challenge to my own thinking. But you know, I had to change my own internal narrative. You know, at the end of the day, and that took a long time. But you know, then you know, then later recognizing that actually my dyslexia was not my disadvantage, but it was my advantage. Mm-hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't a <laughs> well. Oh, I hate it. You know. It's, it's commonly described as a learning disability. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, well, I'm, let me put it this way. I object to being, to being, to dyslexia being called a, a learning disability because I'm a very able person and, mm. and people who are dyslexic are very able. So I object to that. I also object to it being called a learning difficulty because we don't struggle to learn. Dyslexics can learn very fast. We just learn differently. Yes. So, you know, I've been on a big campaign um, in in, in recent times to stop describing dyslexia as a learning disability disorder or difficulty and simply call it a learning difference. Yes. People with dyslexia are not less intelligent. We just we just process information differently. 
And actually, we process it a lot faster than some other people. Well, yeah. And what was the one I saw today? Condition. Tell, tell me about your neurodiverse condition. I don't have a condition. <laughs> yeah. Or, or you, 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 you suffer with dyslexia. No, I don't suffer with dyslexia. Society suffers because it doesn't understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't anymore. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't anymore. So, you know, the, the, re- the research out there, um, I mean, the company behind Post-it Notes, for example, uh, <laughs> said thinking in pictures is 60,000 times faster than thinking in words. Yes, yes. Now, it's one of the one of the way the differences between people with dyslexia and without dyslexia is people with dyslexia think in pictures. Mm. Now, if that's the case, that means we think a lot faster than other people. When when we think in our way, not their way. When yes. we can think in pictures. See, yeah, you alluded to having a bit of a rough time at school and stuff and dictation exercise weren't fun. So your first introduction to books probably wasn't a fun introduction, was it? No, it wasn't. No, no I remember. I remember enjoying reading the Famous Five, but oh, yeah. it, it never got more complicated than that. And I and I'd read a book and then have no idea what it said. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Do you ever do that thing where you feigned reading a book in class so you didn't get told off for not reading? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So you know, what, one day somebody turned around to me and said, "Matt, you've got a book in you." I was like, "What?" Hey. <laughs> hey, book, and I was like, "No, you don't understand." <laughs> I was in remedial English at school. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I struggled. Um, you know, like I, I, I found it impossible to write an essay, or you know, it's just I, I hated it. So when this person said you got a book in you, I, I was a little bit taken aback, and they mm. actually picked up the phone, uh, dialed their their publisher, and said, "I've got oh, I've got a young guy here. He's got a book in him. Will you publish it?" And I was sat there beside him. And then he passed me the phone. Okay. Uh, and then he, he wet myself. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> so to set the scene, what were you doing at that particular time? What sort of age were you? Where were oh, you working? Oh, my goodness. Um, I, was, um, I was about 30 years old. Okay. Yeah, about 30 years old. Gosh, time flies, doesn't it? About, <laughs> it does, about yeah. 30 years old. You know, I've... I had a job when I left school for five years, and it was okay. But since then, I've never. I've, I'm, I, I always say I'm unemployable. You look at my CV; it's all over the place. I've always started things. Mm. But, yeah, I'm the classic. They say there's a disproportionate number of entrepreneurs who are dyslexic or or a neurodivergent. Yeah, uh, you know, and that's that's me. I don't. I hate a nine to five. I hate going to an office. I, you know, I'm very. I've, I've got a very high work ethic. But I hate being told what to do, and I hate writing reports, and I hate writing proposals, and so I've always built businesses that have and ventures. <laughs> businesses might be a bit glamorous. I've always built <laughs> ventures. Uh, you know, most of them have failed, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, it, 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 and, and uh, they've always succeeded enough for me to earn, you know, earn a living, which is I'm really grateful for. Um, but yeah, but books always seemed way out there. Yeah. yeah. So I wrote my first book, and and I, and and I've now I've actually authored twenty books now, and I've developed you know I've developed approaches to writing books that 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 help me. I, I make it very ABC. Do you know what I mean? I I I have a process. I see the process from beginning to end, and and I use that same process every time I write a book. It's like a little formula that I apply. <laughs> what do you think the person that said there's a book in you, what do you think they saw in you? Are you doing lots of verbal talk, storytelling? Yes. Or? yes. Yeah, I was doing lots of speaking. Um, but it's a very different art form to write rather than being a writer. You know, I've always found be Well, I haven't always. You know, since I started speaking, I found my feet, and I'm a very comfortable orator confident orator i can stand up without notes for 45 minutes you know and, and speak that is something i've learned to do and now i love doing it um whereas writing a book is quite different it's a different art form it's not just a matter of taking a speech and popping it into a book as a chapter it's it, it's a different it's a it's a different medium of communication and uh yeah so what is well let, let's go to book one really let's start off with 
you know, your friend has said to you, there's a book in you, you've got a publisher on your phone, in your ear, and they've convinced you to do it. <laughs> so now you're in the cold light of day and you're like, where do I start? So what did you do to get that first book out of your head? Yeah, well, what I did, I, I actually dictated. I, uh, uh, so okay. I wrote bullet points. I wrote an, an outline for the book, you know, what whatever it was, 10 chapters. Um, and, uh, and then I bullet pointed each chapter, worked out how I was going to introduce the chapter, worked out how I was going to conclude the chapter. And then I just got a dictaphone, as they were in those days. And I just <laughs> went for a walk and I dictated the chapter. And then had somebody transcribe it and, and polish it up. So that's how I did my first book. Yeah. But then as I've done more, I've grown more confident in my own ability to write. And I still have somebody do a heavy edit and a copy yeah. and, a, yeah, and, a, and a proofread, of course. But, um, yeah, I've just grown in confidence that I can do this. Yeah. Yeah, you've done 20 of them. So yeah, there's a fair bit of iteration across the process. And uh, what sort of things did you discover in the way? What were you kind of, after that first bit of dictation, you must have been sat there thinking, this is okay, but I want something a bit more fluid because, I, I mean, I've tried dictating articles and stuff and, it kind of works, but it never quite feels natural. <laughs> no, when you dictate, you use a lot more words because you witter on. You, know, you do. When you're yes. <laughs> coming down, you, you're, you're a lot more, well, I'm a lot more succinct. I get to the point far more quickly. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and I experienced this because I, I actually coach other people to write their books mm. now. Mm. And I, was, if I say to me, if you can't write, dictate. But actually, you dictate so many more words than you would write. And so the editorial stage of a transcript is much heavier and it takes much more time because you've got so much, so many more words to edit down to get to the true core of what you want to say. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, so you dictate your first run. Um, you said you're about using professional editors or other people. Do you first do your own edit yourself, if you're, whether it's you or somebody you're coaching to get that? thinned out or do you farm it out pretty quickly no no i i encourage three edits with the people i work with okay a, a personal edit a private edit and a professional edit so right. the personal edit is your own run through you know you run through and primarily your sense making yeah you're just ma- ensuring that what you've written makes sense like what you're <laughs> kind, kind of useful i would have said yeah yeah, yeah. And, I, and perhaps I've got a name for it because actually a lot of what I write doesn't make sense. And so I need to go through <laughs> and make sure it makes sense. But it's sense making, you know, and I, you do a little bit. I'm not, I've still got no idea about grammar. I put the odd full stop in and comma in. It's about right. as sophisticated as mine gets. And, um, and, you know, I might pick up a spelling mistake, but it's more likely the, uh, the, the, the um, software that does. Mm. Um, and that's what, that's my first edit level. And that's why I encourage all my students to do. You know, once they've written the book, um, to sit down and edit it from beginning to end, read it through and sense make. Um, make sure you've not duplicated stories and work on the grammar, work on the spelling, all that stuff. Um, because actually I say to my students, when you write your book, you mustn't edit it as you go. So you have to write it as a stream of consciousness. Just get it out. Uh, okay. do, not, do not reread what you've written till you've finished yeah. it. And then you reread it and you do the editorial. So, and then the second editor is what I call the private edit. <clears throat> That's when you find two or three people at most who uh, who love you enough to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we've all got friends who will pat us on the back, whatever we do, no matter how rubbish it is or good it is. <laughs> you know, we need them. But actually sometimes, and certainly with a book, you need to actually ask your friends who uh, will be candid with you, even if it hurts a little bit, mm. and give it to them and say, look, what do you think? And they they can be quite brutal, but you need that because yeah. then you get the chance to re rejig it, recraft it, you know, in certain places. Yeah. And then the third stage is the professional edit, which is what your publisher does for you. Okay. Yeah. So you know, publish you my my uh, my venture. We coach people to write their book in a hundred days. We publish their book in a hundred days, and we help them launch their book in a hundred days. So in a year, you've got your book out there. Um, and we have a team of copy editors, team of proofreaders. So people say, well, I'm not sure if it's quite right. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I say, we'll leave it to us. You know, we will, you do your best and then we will, we will polish it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And, um, 
What was the spark behind that kind of type of business, doing publish you and actually helping other people get their books out there? It sounds like your kind of your kind of road is kind of interesting. You sound like you didn't have a burning desire to write a book until somebody else said there's a book in you, and then sort of picked up the love for it afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. So why why coach other people to write books? Well, because I because I've authored you know, 20 books, people always come to me for help. Oh, mm-hmm. Matt, I've got a book idea. I've started a book and I got stuck or I'm not sure which of the books to write first or I've been writing for seven years and I can't finish the thing. You know, so they come to you for help. And, and I always want to help people. And a couple of years ago, the number of people coming to me for help was just getting crazy. This was not my job. <laughs> it was just something I did because I like helping people. Yeah. You know, I thought, well, why not make life easier for myself and for them? And why not codify my process? So I found myself repeating myself to different people. And I thought, I've, I've actually got a really strong methodology and a process. So why not codify it, create a course, and coach people through it in groups? So, and, you know, and let them pay for the privilege. Um, so, you know, so that's, that's when it started just two years ago. Um, yeah. And now I coach over 100 people a year to write, publish, and launch their books. So it's, yeah, it's, it's taken off. Yeah. yeah. So are they fiction, non-fiction, a blend of the two? Do you get- uh, it's a real, really eclectic mix. Pro- predominantly, predominantly, we do non-fiction, but we do some fiction. Predominantly, books for adults, but occasionally, kids' book. Um, yeah, predominantly, word-based books, but we do some books with a lot more images. I've written a travel guide to Notto on the island of Sicily in Italy. Um, yeah. so it's got lots of photos in it, my own photos. So I, always, I always joke with people and say, I'm a published photographer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, what they don't know is all the photos are taken on my iPhone. It's amazing what, what photos you can get out of an iPhone. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so we do all sorts of books, but predominantly non-fiction books. Mm, okay. And... Um... I suppose you wouldn't know how much neurodiversity is coming through the door, would you? If because yeah, people have probably seen somebody that you've mentioned dyslexic, do you find you get a lot more dyslexics come through to you at all? No, not really. Everybody who starts the course or who wants to write a book anytime, anywhere, any place has their own obstacles and barriers to overcome. It just happens that mine was dyslexia, and other people come with other barriers and other obstacles. So, you know, the beginning of the course, I I invite people to put their internal barriers on the table. Just say, look, let's be honest with each other. You know, what what is the one or two what are the one or two things that could prevent you from writing this book? Mm. And they're internal factors. It's not about time to write, it's it's self-belief, imposter syndrome, you know. Yeah, the people people live life with scars, internal scars. And they do. So I just encourage people to get those out on the table because as, as, as soon as you've named these things, you've reduced their power. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And then we then I kind of talk to people about motivation. What why are you writing a book? Um, so I encourage them, you know, turn down the volume on that little critical voice in your head and turn up the volume on your motivation. So actually don't just take something away, put something in its place. So, you know, remove the obstacles and put in your core drive and purpose and motivation for writing the book. So, yeah, you replace the negative with the positive. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and that's what you find, really. It's not necessarily, you know, when I was sort of, I was thinking about it, and this could be my very practical mind being an engineer and all that. Like, I'm like, what's the mechanics? But actually, it's the internal dialogue is the problem for most people in terms of, if they want to, if they think they've got a story that they need to get out there, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the I have a very strong step by step methodology, and I always say to my students, if you trust me, trust the process, i.e., do the assignments I set, and trust yourself, you'll finish the hundred days with a manuscript for your book. Nice. And, and eight out of ten people finish my course with a manuscript for their book. Um, and I can tell the ones that won't because they don't complete the assignments in the first couple of sessions. Right. Think, yeah. well, if, you, if you can't spend an hour doing an assignment, when it's a 10-hour assignment, you're not going to stand a chance, are you? So no. it's very easy to tell. 
So I can tell it up front who are the people. I, I know who the people are going to succeed are. Because yeah. they're the ones who trust me, trust the process and trust themselves. <laughs> Yes, and I, I know you're not going to tell us the process because obviously that's behind your paywall. But uh, um, <laughs> if if I was say I had said book idea in mind and I come to you, what is the kind of first few things we do just to sort of get a flavour of what it's like to be a customer of yours in terms of using publish yeah. you? Yeah, well, I mean, you don't have to be a customer. I'm very happy to help you. So if you're listening to this and thinking I've got an idea or two, I'm not sure. Um, uh, let me give you a little workbook. It's, it's called My Book Idea. Right. And you can download it now from my website. If you go to publish, the letter U.com, so yeah. www.publishu.com, uh, oblique free. And it will take you to a web page and uh, you pop in your name and email and I will send you um, a copy of My Book Idea. And that's where I encourage you all the people I try and help to begin okay. to really try and crystallize that first idea. So before you even start the course, you know, you're working uh, with the, the the key story or the key message you want to communicate. Yeah, yeah. Really, really solid idea by that point, rather than kind of, I guess that thins people out a little bit, doesn't it? So we can crystallise an idea that they're going to go forward. So something yeah. sort of like a bit, still a bit vague after using the guide, then maybe haven't quite got it exactly in mind what they want. Yeah. And the first two or three sessions of the course, we're refining the idea. Um, there's nothing like talking to a group of peers and an experienced coach like myself about your idea to hone in and improve it um you know it's just that's the way it works so you know, all my coaching is actually in small groups because the power of writing your book in a peer group is really is really um potent um people often think that writing a book oh you need to go off to a log cabin in the mountains for six months but actually i think like, like most things in life um books are best written in a community um where you've got mutual encouragement support inspiration as well as challenge and accountability so i create a, <laughs> a high a high support and a high challenge environment where we cheer one another on but we're also very candid um in challenging each other no oh, yeah yeah you can see that it's the whole peer group thing isn't it and yeah we all have visions don't we remember pictures of ian fleming and golden eye and all that kind of stuff where he disappears as you make on sit on his own and it all seems sort of glamorous but I actually hadn't thought of it like that. Actually, you need the other people around you to kind of not only inspire and motivate, but make you accountable to it, yeah. as with quite a lot of things in life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, you mentioned about, obviously, you now feel more comfortable with your dyslexia you've worked through. You've written 20 books. Now, it's kind of interesting. A dyslexic person who loves books, it always boggles my mind because I'm she had been reading the same book on my Kindle for about two years. <laughs> As it gets put down, goes flat, gets covered in dust, and I pick it up again. Do you find you now read more books and enjoy the kind of reading process more after doing all of that kind of stuff and also come to terms with and be more confident with your internal voice about this next year? Yeah, I do read uh, books, not, not loads. I have people who read books for me. Um, I do most of my learning in conversation. By osmosis, I like being with people, like going to places, um, and I and I learn. I, I feel I learn in osmo by osmosis. Just I absorb things, um, you know. So I tend to read books predominantly for entertainment. You know, I love to yeah. take a novel on holiday, a good yeah. crime crime thriller or something. <laughs> <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but when I learn, when I read books for learning, I tend to skim through them. Okay. Uh, you know, I used to, you know, I grew up in a home where you'd never mark a book and you'd read it from beginning to end. And now I think, no, if a, if a book's valuable, you should scribble all over it. If a, <laughs> if, a book's, if a book's valuable, you know, you can skim through it and take the nuggets. So I'm very happy to turn the corners on books, highlight things in books. I'm happy to race past pieces that aren't relevant to me uh, to get yeah. to the golden nuggets. So I have a different approach to, 
to reading um, you know, books that you learn from. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, I tend to use most of that sort of non-fiction stuff. I tend to do um, in audio books, but I do think there's a little bit missing that you can't sit and stop the car in the middle of the motorway and make a note on anything. So <laughs> turning the corners and all that kind of stuff does make sense to me. <laughs> So, Publish You has been going for a couple of years. What's the sort of biggest success stories do you feel you've had out of that? What sort of book do you think has been made you most proud of the person managed to get it out? You know, I'm proud of every book, and I know that sounds <laughs> it's, it's true. You know, today we published a book for uh, an 85 year old gentleman wow. whose children and grandchildren said, um, Dad, granddad, please will you write down your stories. We don't want them to, to die with you. Oh, um, wow, you know, that's really cool. Uh, so I coached him to write. We have a few people like that. Coached him to write the book, and at the end, he said, "Oh, Matt, you know, how should I give it to my family?" I said, "Well, go and find a local printer, run off fifty copies, and give it to them." Mm. And he said, "Okay." And he came back to me the week later. He said, "I spoke to my family, and they said if he will publish it, he thinks they th they think I should get it published with you." So we published it today. So it's out there, not just for his family, but for others to um, oh. enjoy and read. Some proud oh, nice. of. You know, I'm proud of, um, I coached a business recently in the Channel Islands um, to write a book on their core intelligence. So they're a leadership consultant. Well, it's called the Leadership Consultancy. And yeah. Yeah, I, worked with a, I worked with the team and coached the team to write the book together. You know, oh, okay. that was quite different. And I'm really proud of that. Um, I coached a lady recently who wrote a book called Moments in Mummydom. She's got nine children. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she's written a book about, yeah, Moments in Mummydom, funny stories, profound stories from, from being a mum. And, you know, and it's not written from the, oh, like, I'm the expert. It's kind of written, oh, I get things wrong every day all the time. And these <laughs> are the things, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, proud of that. So, yeah, every, we publish a new book every week. And um, I al I'm always, because I know the moment a book's published, I'm always the first person to go and buy a couple of copies, <laughs> one to have in Italy and one to have in the UK. Um, you know, and I've got a bookshelf in my my holiday home, just got all the all the books I've coached people to write and publish. Oh, that's cool. And it's getting longer and longer and longer. I was going to uh, say, 100 people a year, you're going to have to get a bigger bookshelf. <laughs> absolutely. I was going to get to the, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to have to put up another shelf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah, I'm proud of every book. And yeah, I say, I say to authors, you know, you're probably not going to be a bestseller, mm. but I want to help you write the best book you can. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Yeah, as always, it's bad to compare ourselves with other people. You know, we yes, you can always make yourself self feel crap by you yes. know comparing yourself to somebody who's whatever better than you are. Apparently, um, <laughs> that's not the point. You know, actually, the only person we should compare ourselves with is who we were yesterday, and are we better today? So, the people I work with, you know, for me, I always say to them, you know, I, I want to coach you to write the best book you possibly can. And for me, that's success. And I imagine it's poor motivation to write a book if you're just trying to write a bestseller and I guess the fame and fortune that comes with that. Yeah. But the reality is less than 1% of, of authors make a living from writing a book. For most of us, it's extra, an extra holiday. And, you know, depending on how well your book does, it it depends whether it's, um you know, drive down the road for an overnight or <laughs> fly off the other side of the world for a month, you know, staying in a lovely hotel. So it, it all depends, <laughs> you know, what sort of holiday the book's for. So I always say to my authors, look, you know, most, for most people, you know, writing and publishing a book, you know, gives you an extra holiday a year. And depending on how well the, the book does, depends what sort of holiday you get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. The local premier in or or all the Ritz is the difference. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah the Ford or the Rolls Royce, you know. It's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, obviously, um, you write for newspapers as well, and I'm curious to know what the difference is between writing for a newspaper versus writing your own books. Apart from duration, <laughs> length yeah. I mean, of article, yeah, um, that's a good question. 
I mean, you you basically got to really get to the point in an article. Mm. And it's got to be very current affairs. Books don't have to be current affairs. They can be, but they don't have to be. But articles, you have to, you have to kind of hang it on something. You know, so I wrote an article for the Times newspaper last week because it was Dyslexia Awareness Week. Yes. And the headline of the article was um, Dyslexia is a gift of God and not a learning difficulty mm. uh, or disability. And, uh, you know, so you can imagine what it's like having heard me. Um, but, you know, I'm picking up on something. Of what, there's always a hook to write for a newspaper. It's got to be current affairs focused. Whereas a book, it's a bit more evergreen. You know, you want to write a book that's going to stand the test of time and isn't linked to one, you know, historical event. Um, you know, unless you write a history book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be important then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I guess writing an article, writing a book is about obviously about the length, <laughs> and uh, it's it, you know articles are much more current affairs focused, certainly for a newspaper. Yeah, whereas yeah. books are more evergreen. Yeah, and and I guess you've got the newspaper editor and the people from there who want it turned around faster and all that kind of thing, yeah, thing as well. Yeah, yeah they, they do. Um, although we turn our books around pretty fast. I mean, you go to a traditional publisher. And it'll yeah. be 12 to 18 months before your book is uh, in your hand. 12 yeah. to 18 months. 12 months would be remarkable. It's closer to 18 months, whereas we do it in 100 days. So you, you submit your manuscript, and within 100 days, you'll have a physical copy in your hand. Yeah, that's rapid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's take a quick detour from books. You have lots and lots of other side projects that uh, are quite numerous. Now, quite a lot of them seem to be giving back as well, a bit along the lines of Publish You. Now, what are the sparks be behind jumping out of publishing to do other things? I think I've got a hint from that early on that you start many, many businesses, some fall over and some survive. Um, so you just love spinning plates and doing different things all the time. Yeah, I think one of the things I've realized over the years is that I'm an ideator, I'm a creative, right. I have lots of ideas, you know, and the research says that 35% of company founders in the USA mm. are identified as dyslexic, whereas only 15% of the population. So, you know, creative <laughs> entrepreneurship, you know, it, it, you know, people with dyslexia are draw, are, are naturally more creative, great problem solvers. Um, yeah, so you know, I've just lent into the fact that I've probably I'll probably never have another job in my life because I always <laughs> my own jobs. Yeah, you know, and I, I and I've applied for stuff. I applied to be a member of parliament, and uh, oh, and I was told that I wasn't party political enough. I don't. I'm not embarrassed about that actually. Um, <laughs> I, I've, I've, I, I have I have actually applied for jobs, but never got them. Um, ah, okay. So I, I always say, you know, I'm I'm absolutely unemployable. Um, because my CV is all over the place. So I always make my own jobs, you know, and I I make my own jobs around stuff I'm passionate about. Yeah, yeah. So I run a foundation, global foundation called Neighbour, N-A-Y-B-A, uh, okay. as in love your neighbour, but spelled um, uh, from a language in South America, just because uh. we could and wanted to. And, uh, you know, <laughs> work in a dozen countries on four continents, you know, helping um, helping churches to love and serve people who are who are having it tough, you know, yeah. are experiencing vulnerability, isolation, injustice. So maybe helping people who are homeless or in debt or wrestling with their mental health or victims of antisocial behavior or, I mean, the list goes on. Um, and we love, I love seeing people who are experiencing pain loved and looked after by other people mm -hmm. um so uh you know and that's some that, that's a foundation that i started um you know and it's it's it, in one sense you look and think wow it's big but in a sense it's small compared to some of the others out there but again it's not about comparing yourself to what else is out there it's just saying, yeah. actually, you know this is this is unique in this way um so neighbor is one of my ventures um and uh and there's obviously the property in in sicily um you know which i i use and then i rent uh when i'm not there so 
you know, it's a little holiday business. Uh, written, as I said, I've written a travel guide to the city. Um, you know, promoted all the best restaurants and the wineries and the beaches along the the ten top ten beaches along the eastern seaboard where the city is, and you know, all the yeah, a lot of the UNESCO World Heritage sites in Sicily and all that. So I've, you know, I love marketing things, and uh, you know, I, I love marketing my city to the world and saying how amazing it is because it is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. No, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? So that's this sort of dyslexic thing sometimes with the entrepreneurship, but also yeah, the businesses are different to one another. So there's, I was thinking it's interesting some dyslexics are able to do, which they're actually able to see the kind of, the, how their skills plug into different things. So you end up looking like a bit of a generalist, but actually you're using specialist knowledge just across a wider set of things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you are. Um, so I love starting stuff, but I have a <laughs> rule that I only start stuff that I'm passionate about. Yes. And I only keep running stuff when I'm passionate about it. When yeah. I stop being passionate about it, um, I pass it on in one, in one shape or form. Okay. I, I step away a bit and hand it on to somebody who's excited about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's nothing like killing worth ethic than the passion disappearing is there. <laughs> No, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, yeah, I, I would describe myself as a business and social entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. I love starting things, um, and love starting things that contribute something back to the world. Yeah. 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 Very good. And you know, that must make you feel great after doing that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then nice to make a little bit of money along the way and. Yeah, uh, keep, and live your life, keep the roof over your head. Exactly, you've got to keep the lights on and uh, yeah, enjoy life as well. <laughs> it's, it's more expensive to keep the lights on than it's ever been. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I agree with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what people don't know is we're recording this podcast in the dark to save electricity. <laughs> <laughs> no, just joking. The lights are on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We can all, we can see each other. It's fine. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, every guest that comes on this podcast gets three rapid fire questions from myself. We don't necessarily okay. need rapid fire answers for you, but they're just sort of three quick things that we tend to round the podcast out with. So let's dive into question number one. What prejudice have you had about dyslexia that has been proven wrong? So much. Um, I think I think my first prejudice was taught me by my teachers that, mm. that I was stupid. That's before I thought I had, that's before I knew what dyslexia was. But then when I discovered what dyslexia was, then I thought, oh, that's why I'm stupid. Yes. So um, that was that's my number one prejudice that I've personally yeah. had to wrestle with and overcome. Well, that's interesting. You discovered your dyslexia and go, that is why I'm stupid, rather than actually that is the reason this happens. Because actually quite a lot of guests will say they discover they have dyslexia and they're like, Oh, I'm not stupid, but you didn't didn't lose that narrative at all. Not where it started, no. It's all oh, that's why I'm stupid. There is uh-huh. something, there is something wrong with me. Yes. Yeah. Oh god. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's getting smashing them self living beliefs takes a lot of time, doesn't it? Just chip it away at them. Yeah. 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 Okay. Question number two in this rapid fire set. If an alien landed and you had to describe dyslexia to them, how would you do it? Yeah, I'd show them a film and I'd show them a book. Okay. And I'd say dyslexics think visually. Right. And non-dyslexics think in words. Yeah. To dominate them. Yeah. Yes. If I had to really try and simplify it, I know there's lots of flaws with that metaphor, but if I had to try and really dumb it right down, mm. um, you know, words are something that people with dyslexia learn over a long time to manage and stuff. Um, but we're great with pictures. Yes. Not yes. necessarily drawing them, but seeing life in pictures. And it's why I can stand up and speak for 45 minutes without a single note, because I see, I visualize my talk from beginning to end. Yeah, yeah. As yeah. a storyboard, a pictorial storyboard. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and you're just touching the storyboard points to weaving the narrative together. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And the final question is rapid fire set. And seeing as this is called the Dyslexia Life Hack Show, what is your favorite dyslexia life hack? 
Oh my goodness! I bought a memorable telephone number. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's a new one. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, it's uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's yeah, triple one number, triple another number, and triple another number. <laughs> It's dead easy to remember. <laughs> the thing I hate is if you tr- if you're trying to do one of those kind of um, you've got to provide some ID, and they say what are the last three digits or four digits of your phone number? And I just go blank. I don't, mm. I don't know. <laughs> and I have to read the number through my head from the beginning, and even then yeah. I get I, I yeah. can't. Yeah, you know, but with my number, it's easy. <laughs> my last three digits, triple two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Three digits before that, a triple one. So it didn't hey. get much easier than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that is pretty damn easy. And then, yeah, now everybody just needs to work at your dialing code. We're there, 07. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's easy. But yeah, my, my number's publicly out, out there, you know, if you want to WhatsApp me and you're listening to this, you know, you'd... Uh, if 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 you're not if 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 you're a nuisance, I'll just archive you. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, seriously, if you want to message me, oh seven triple four triple one triple two, what's that? Me, if you interested in anything I've said today? Um, but that's 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 my that would be one of my little personal hacks. Uh, the other is I keep notebooks um, in different places. I love to scribble. And some people keep notebooks and you, you open them and they're pristine. Mine are not. Mine are an absolute mess. But I've discovered if I scribble, it just helps me process things in my head. Yeah. So I yeah. scribble, scribble, scribble away. Um, yeah. So my notebooks are an absolute mess. Uh, <laughs> they'd, they'd never be safe posterity. <laughs> but but I, like, I like notebooks. Uh, yeah. An actual, an actual, really nice pencil, thick pencil. Yeah, book yeah. for me, I can't beat it. And then <laughs> another one is team. You know, I rely on a lot on other people. I mean, I run yeah. a publishing company. I'm not doing the copy editing and the proofreading. No, but, no, but, but, not. but, I, but I've got people who are really good at that. Yeah. yeah. So, my, yes, yeah, my other big, my, probably my biggest hack is I work with other people. I build teams because then you do the bits you do best, and let others do the rest. Yeah, yeah. Well, that just leaves me to ask you, is there anything else you'd like to add? And you already sort of alluded to where people can find you before we sign off. Yeah, um, it's been great to be with you, great to chat. You can find Thank me you. at publishu, the letter U, dot com. Uh, that's the best online place, or just find me on social media, Matt Bird Global. Uh, on Instagram, Matt Bird Global. On Facebook, Matt Bird Global. On Twitter, Matt Bird Global. Um, just Matt Bird Global. So send me a message. I yep. uh, would love to hear from you. And of course, I'll drop that on the show notes at dyslexialifehacks.com forward slash podcast. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to come and talk to me on this podcast this evening. It's been really interesting hearing how you approach books and how you approach coaching other people to write their own books. Thank you. It's been great to be with you, Matthew. Yeah, thank you very much. And I want to thank everybody else for taking the time to listen, and I'll speak to you in the next episode. Goodbye for now. Bye.